Uh, and today I will be talking about irrigation management for vegetable crops. Um, I, I would like to say that what I'm gonna talk to here it's uh, something that I really like have been doing research on it. So if you have any question, please feel free to interrupt me or make a question. I would love to answer those questions. And I would like to say irrigation is a key uh, component of a crop management practice that will make you guys achieve the potential yield of your crop. It can allow you to do an extra peak of your squash if you're doing a squash. It can allow your um, uh, bell peppers fruits or tomato fruits to grow a little bit bigger in haste the, the price of that produce. So it's a key component that also can help you guys to save money when you're going to be applying fertilizer. And imagine how the cost of fertilizing is increasing recently. So if you properly manage your irrigation, you have a lot of returns that's going to benefit you. So I will be talking a little bit about the different irrigation systems that we have available for vegetable production. But what I also what also I would like to talk today is about of how to schedule your irrigation events because that's how you manage your water and that's important. You can have a drip system, you can have an overhead system, but it's still if you don't properly manage your irrigation events or how much water you are applying you're going to have issues. And I will not be focused on how much water a crop required because that's change from location to location, from field to field. And you're going to need to understand your field in order to know how much water you should be applying. We can come, we can, we can come with those numbers as you need. If you don't know how to manage your crop, your irrigation system, contact your uh, regional agent or contact me we can come with that number but i will not be focused on that today i will just give an overview of those numbers but you remember it's site effective it's site dependent so let's go ahead and talk about my first slide which is irrigation system of course all the time we talk about irrigation like everybody oh what system do you have how do you how do you how often do you apply or uh you apply in the morning or in the afternoon or you have a drip, you have a sprinkler, how many sprinkler you have per area, or what is the spacing of your emitters into a drip tape? So those are all questions that you need to have in consideration when selecting your irrigation systems. So first is, what crop are you growing? Is that crop will respond better for a drip or for a sprinkler? Like most of vegetable crops, I would recommend the drip irrigation. However, if you have like, single rows like this potato field here, yes, a sprinkler would do better. So just keep that in mind. You need to see what is the convenience of your system or of your area, and then you're gonna identify what irrigation system you should have. A couple of things that you should have in mind is that a drip irrigation provides you a much higher efficiency of water application than a sprinkler. The efficiency of a drip irrigation system is about nine, sorry, it's about 90 to 95%, while your sprinkler irrigation, 80 and 85%. That efficiency is related of how much water is pumped in your system and how much water is delivered to the root zone of your crop. So with a drip tape, your emitters are right next to the root zone. So your, your water is strictly applied there. So your efficiency will be as higher as more precise you apply water. While in the sprinkler, you can have loss through evaporation on top of your, um, from the, from the, as water is being applied, you can have uh, drift with the wind and you don't apply that only in the root zone. You are applying that in an entire area. And that's the second bullet point that I put here. On the drip irrigation, your water target a root zone. While in the sprinkler irrigation, your, your uh, irrigation event target an area. So you need to keep that in mind. Drip irrigation also allow for a fertigation. So you can inject fertilizer through your drip line to get, that's gonna be precisely applied in your root zone. While sprinkler, you can also do a fertigation, but attention, you may burn your plants if you don't provide the right um, fertilizer application. So those are the pros and cons of drip and sprinkler. You can see that so far drip is being our best option. And for vegetable, I will tell you, yes, it's a good option. It's one of the best, but there are cases that you may require sprinkler. So drip 
it's an annual investment. So every year, every time that you install a crop, you're gonna need to have a new drip line. And but in other, in the other hand, it requires a low pump to costs, a low uh, a low cost of pumping water. So that's one of the the pros and cons of drip as well. One one uh, annual investment. While in the sprinkler, you just do the investment one time. But that investment, it's a very high investment that will also require a high pumping cost. So keep that in mind. Most of sprinkler irrigation can be done to a stationary sprinklers that they are installed in the field and don't move, or they can have a center pivot or a linear movement. And that's going to travel through the field and apply water uniformly through the field. Drip irrigation, you can do that in a bare ground, in the high tunnels. It's very common. And, but also in the open field, or you can have them in a plastic mulching system. And that's what is the ideal because with the plastic mulching system, you minimize your loss by evaporation from what of water from the soil. So the drip irrigation system so far is the most recommended system for vegetables. But keep in mind that sprinkler can also be an option and then sometimes is the best option. Once you identify your irrigation system, then you can go ahead and move for your how uh, on, you can go ahead and determine how to apply water. And I don't want to be stuck in this table very long, but I need you guys to understand what's going on. Most of you have already seen this table from my presentation, and I like to show it because there are several ways on how you can manage water. And when you manage water, you are talking about irrigation events. Consequently, you are talking about irrigation scheduling, which is how to determine when to apply water. And this is based on the water management or your scheduling level. So currently we have about six ranks and I always keep that six ranks in mind because you can apply irrigate as, as rank zero which is irrigation whenever, when you don't have a scheduling of irrigation events. Basically, you are walking through your field, you see a need of water to be applied, and you go there and apply water. The other one is the fuel and appearance method, which I will not go in depth. I just will say that is a USDA method of irrigation scheduling, and uh, it also requires the feeling. It's going to compare soil colors with a chart that the USDA provide. If you Google in your computer there or in your cell phone, fill an appearance method of irrigation scheduling by the USDA. You're gonna find those charts and and they're gonna you're gonna be able to understand what I'm talking. But I just would would like to say you I don't recommend that, that method because it's based it's still by a feeling. So it's the same as the irrigate whenever. The second rank or rank two is our systematic irrigation method. And that's very common in agricultural, in commercial agricultural fields, or it can be common as well in home gardens because you can connect it to your, uh, to a irrigation panel. And that means that you're gonna be applying water in the same time and or in the same volume base, regardless of the weather and soil water condition. So basically it means that every day you're gonna program a panel of irrigation for the same volume and same or same time duration every day. So that will be supplying water by the crop with the same amount. That one, it's okay, but we don't recommend that because if you're not considering weather and soil water conditions, you can probably apply more water than your crop required or your crop soil can hold, and then you're gonna be losing nutrients to uh, leaching. Or you can lack water if you're, apply you're applying less water than your crop needs, then you're going to have dry stress. So you're going to lose yield as well. So in both scenarios of less water or more water, you are losing. So you don't want to do that. Finally, you have rank three, rank four, and rank five. And those are the ones that I will focus today. Crop water demand, soil water stats, and water budget method. You probably have seen me talking about that because that's a little bit of the folks of what I have been doing and what I would like you guys to understand is how it can benefit your, your home garden or your commercial field using one of those three uh, methods of irrigation scheduling. So let's start with the crop water demand method. Basically, the crop water demand method is, is known as the crop evapotranspiration, which is how much water your 
system lost to the environment. So you want to know water can be applied in your system to irrigation or through rainfall events. As the water is applied to your system, water will, will penetrate, will like filtrate, uh, will penetrate in the soil and will be uptake by the roots of your crop and can be lost by evaporation when it's lost from the soil or it can be lost by transpiration when it's lost by your plant. When you combine the amount of water lost from the soil and the water of water and the amount of water lost by the environment, by the plants, you have your evapotranspiration. So it can be easily calculated as you just multiply your uh, reference evaporation, which is your soil water, by a crop coefficient, which is your transpiration water. And this information can be found in some of the Auburn University weather station, that is the Mesonet. So as you enter there, you're gonna find your ETO, your reference evapotranspiration, that is how much water is lost from the soil. This is a very complex equation that you guys don't even need to know about, but you guys know that it's dependent on your location on the state, on, on the on the earth, the this distance from the sun, your um, time of year, wind, temperature and several other factors that impact. But what you can know is that you can find that information as you connect to the Auburn University Mesonet. Once you identify your daily reference evapotranspiration, which we call ETO, you can, you can find how much water your crop consume per stage of growth development. Here is a list of vegetable crops and how much should be the KC, which is our crop coefficient, in the early season, initial, mid season, mid, mid, KC mid, or end of the season, KC end. So here is the crop coefficient and how it should be considered. As you plant your crop, you have a low KC, which means crops are not losing much water, are not uptaking much water. So you don't need to multiply by a higher number. But as you have the vegetative stage and your crops are flowering, fruiting, and even getting that maturity, you have an increase of your uh, water requirement. So you need to account for that. And then in the end of the season, as you harvest, you don't need to apply much water for the crops anymore, but you still need to supply water for them to continue to produce or allow fruits to get mature. So keep that in mind. You don't need to understand what is going in this graph, but you need to know what the number you're going to use to multiply by that reference of apotranspiration or that ETO that you find in, the, in your weather station. Once you identify that, you can use the information to supply water for your crop in a daily basis in a weekly base or historically. I will not get in much in the historical one because you're gonna need several uh, data to do the historical one. So I will focus on the daily in the week. In the daily, and the, for the daily ETC, you can use the ETO from the day before to calculate how much water you're gonna need to apply today. In a weekly, you're gonna make the calculation from the last week and apply in the following week. So that's what you, how you're going to be doing. In the historical, you're going to know how much water was, was lost in that day, and we, you will assume that that's what's losing this day. So let's just give you an example here, which is the watermelon grow during the spring season in South Alabama. Let's say that you are a grow in South Alabama, and you calculate historically how much water is lost by your, uh, by your plants from three planting dates, March 1st, March 15th, April 1st, and April 15th. As you can see, this graph is showing you the weeks after planting and how much water in inches of water per week is being uptake by the plants. So you have your early season here. So remember in the graph for the crop coefficients, this is your KC. Then you have a boom of your vegetative stage, and then you have your flowering, fruiting, and maturity, and then your senescence when your fruitings are getting sweet. Remember that watermelons need continuous water in the end of the season to get sweeter. Don't cut your irrigation events. But that's not the topic right now. So this is how much water you are being per planting day. So basically, as early as you apply, less water you're going to need to do, less water you're going to need. Uh, as, as early you plant, less water you're going to need to apply during the season. But I'm not telling you guys to anticipate your planting. I'm telling you that you are losing more water through for the environment your system is losing more water for the environment as you delay your planting, which means you might gonna need to apply more water events. So just giving you an average, how, this is how you should interpret your data if you're gonna do that historically. Like 
First week, apply about 0.3 inches of water. You have your transplants small, so you don't need much water. Second week, same thing, but then you have a boom. Your plants are growing. You need to supply water for them to grow. Nutrients are uptake through water, so you need to increase how much water you should apply per um, do as crop develop. So that's how much water you will be applying. By the end of the season, the max water in a week is 0.3, 1.3 inches that you will be applying. So that's what would happen in the spring because you go from a cold temperatures to warm temperatures. On the other hand, if you plant cabbage that usually grown during the fall season, you have a reduction of water uptake. And this reduction here, which is the same graph as before, but now for cabbage, is not because cabbage require less water than uh, watermelon. Because if you have this cabbage plant in the spring, the graph, the shape of this curve will be the same as the watermelon. The only difference is cabbage is grown during the fall season. So you are going for warmer temperatures to cold temperatures. So this water law, this reduction in water requirement is not because of our crop coefficients, but because of our loss of water to evaporation. So your soil is losing less water for evaporation in the fall while while it's losing more water evaporation during this during the spring. So it's gonna require more water during the spring than during the fall. So just keep that in mind. So once you understand that, you can start to calculate how much water per week or per day or historically your crop needs, and then you can schedule your irrigation events to apply that amount of water that was lost to your crop. So you're going to be applying water as your crop needs. So you're being precise now. The second, the, the, the fourth method that I mentioned there, which is the soil water status method, is a little bit more complicated than the ETC. You're going to need to apply water based on your soil characteristics. So uh, to know your soil characteristics, you're going to need to know saturation, field capacity, and permanent wilting point. Saturation means your soil is full of water and it cannot hold any more water. And then you're gonna be, you're gonna have leaking or you're gonna have leach, uh, leaching or in high conditions, erosion or runoff. Uh, this usually happens when you have have rainfall events. Field capacity is the maximum water that your soil can hold. So that's what you want in your field to maintain water at field capacity. So plants will have plenty of water to be uptake. Finally, the permanent wilting point is when your soil is dry enough that plants cannot uptake water. So just a, a, a good way to understand this, thinking about a sponge, and I like to give this example because it's pretty, uh, you can pretty see that. And as we do our dishes every day, you understand what I'm talking. Thinking about a sponge that it's, uh, that you do your dishes and you put it under the water from the sink and you fulfill that sponge with water that when you remove the sponge from the water, it starts to, to drip or you are losing water. That's your saturation. As you squeeze that sponge and you cannot remove more water, that's your field capacity because that's the maximum water your sponge can hold. And that's the same thing for the soil. But as your sponge dries and get hard that you can break it in half, in half that's your permanent wilting point. So everything between the per field capacity and permanent wilting point is our available water. And that's what you guys need to understand. Because when you know your soil moisture content, when you know your type of soil, you can determine your field capacity or you can estimate your field capacity and your permanent wilting point and everything between them is your available water. So take this graph here where we have different types of soils according to soil texture. Fine sand, sand loam, sandy sand loam, loam, silt loam. So those are the most common soils in our in Alabama. Sand, sand loam and loam. So you may have some clay as you go north, but this is where we're going to be focused today. So imagine that you have a sand loam soil. So your permanent wilting point will be around 15%. Oops, I'm sorry. Your field capacity will be around 20, 25%. So you have a point, 10% uh, moisture of, of available water. So that's where you want to control your irrigation, your irrigation. But to control irrigation or know what is your soil moisture, you need to have soil moisture sensors. And that's when growers or even home garden is carried about the soil water status methods because you need to do an investment. 
So high moisture sensors can be as ex expensive as two thousand dollars, where you're gonna you can do everything through a cell phone. But it can be as cheap as like fifty bucks, where you're gonna be able to install a, a small tensiometer in your field and daily read, going to the field and read your your tension. So basically that's what you, you're gonna need to do is install soil moisture sensors. So when you install that sensor, you have the readings that we were talking here, your soil moisture content. So that's how you have to do. So if you haven't, I will not get in depth on soil moisture sensors today. We can have a whole conversation about soil moisture sensors, but keep in mind that soil moisture sensors can be very cheap or very expensive. Once you understand the soil moisture, the when you determine the soil, the sensor you want, you can start to do your irrigation events. So basically, I'm gonna go quickly to this example here and show how the volumetric water content varies over a season um, in your planted with uh, with bell peppers. So this is time after transplanting. The blue line here is our field capacity. The red line here is our permanent wilting point. Everything between blue and red is our available water. Everything above blue is our drainage and everything below red is our dry zone. Our volumetric water content is shown in our black line here, while our, our orange line here represents a threshold that I set up, which is 80% of my field capacity that I call readily available water. Every time that my moisture hit that threshold, I turn my irrigation event on until it can return to my field capacity. So during the season, and oh, the blue bars here represent my rainfall events. So during the season, I have uh, I planted my crop. I have two rainfall events, small rainfall events that create some saturation in my field. In my field, but that's okay. We cannot deal with rainfall events, so we need to le just learn how to. Uh, how to deal actually we cannot control rainfall events so you need to learn how to deal with that so as water was being lost by the evaporation and uh or runoff in this case we're gonna have like we're gonna have it coming back returning to our field capacity water start to deplete and then we being uptake by the plants and then we did an irrigation event whoops same thing and that this irrigation event was just uh 0.4 inches of water and it did not reach until field capacity. Later on, as water was depleted, we did a 0.8 inches irrigation event and that we push it up here. So then water was being uptake by the plant again. This shows the water reduction here on this way, like smoothly show that there is root activity on the step of our sensor. So that's make us comfortable saying that water is being uptake by the plant. Rainfall events at 25 to 27, 28 days after uh, planting, push our, our moisture all the way up. And then we had a lot of saturation in our soil, which is not ideal for the crop. However, like I said, we need to learn how to deal with rainfall events. Then our water returned to field capacity. And during this period here, we have just one event and then we could ideally control moisture in our threshold. The readily available water, the orange line and the blue line. So this is a good, management of irrigation events so now when you make me a question oh why growers or big growers don't like rainfall events is because if they don't have rainfall events they don't have saturation in their field so they can properly manage their irrigation events and you're going to understand what's over irrigation or have rainfall events can cause to your fields in this following slide imagine that this is our bed okay so we have here a six feet tall bed Three foot, uh, three foot bed or six foot center to feet center to center bed with this black dot here being our drip line. During the ideal period of irrigation, we started irrigating every day at 8 a.m. and water start to distribute in the soil. As you can see, during the day, we have a water uptake, drying our, our water. Blue means our, our higher moisture, while red means our uh, low moisture. So as you can see, every day at 8 a.m. we have a water application and during the day we have water being uptake. However, a little bit of over water application like today, like this day, we have us more water in like about 16 to 20, 15 to 20 inch deep in the soil. This means that we don't have, that water is not reaching our root zone, which mostly of the time is between six and 12 inches. So that water that I just mentioned in the end of this, of uh, in the end of this um, timeline here, 
like here this means that we are applying a little bit of more water than we need so this is pushing imagine that nutrients are moved with water we are pushing nutrients deeper in the soil so that's why a properly irrigation scaling is necessary because you don't want to move water deep than your root zone which is located right here so keep that in mind so just to show you how this can help or using the soil water status methods we did a trial i'm going to show the results of two of our trials here i'm going to be quickly through that we did a fixed irrigation which is applying the same volume of water every day with a panel versus a controlled irrigation using soil moisture sensors so every day we applied water as needed using the sensor or fix it from 12 to 2 p.m. Just by water savings, we could reduce our water requirement or our water applied by 60%. Just thinking in gallons per acre, we could reduce from about 425,000 gallons to, to 175,000 gallons per acre with the control and irrigation. So first benefit of proper management of irrigation is water savings second one is we see different in our uh in our zucchini plants the difference in colors controlled irrigation versus fixed irrigation can you see the difference between the darker green and the yellow green what does it means nutrient availability so we start to collect uh, plant samples during the season and we measure how much nitrogen was being accumulated so we have here days after planting in nitrogen accumulated the blue line represent our controlled irrigation, while the fixed, uh, the orange line represent our fixed irrigation. Can you see how much more nitrogen was uptake by the controlled when compared to the fixed irrigation? And these show the difference between color of our treatments. Finally, so here is our second ben here is our second benefit: allow a better use of your fertilizer, so reduction in fertilizer cost. Let Ultimately, what you're going to have the best is the return in yield. The controlled irrigation increased yield in 26%. So here is the third benefit. You can increase your yield. So this is not only for zucchini. We did, oops, we did the same trial for bell pepper. I'm going to quickly go through the results, but I want to show another trial that we did. In the same experiment, we start to inject soil. Uh, we start to inject a blue dye in our in our um in our crop and we have that 24 hours for fixed irrigation versus soil moisture sensor so you see where is it located the blue dye we painted our our soil so it's in the root zone here in the fixed irrigation it's almost coming to the second layer three days same thing we are deeper actually at the fixed time and after seven days we found the soil moisture sensor we found blue dye at 16 inches of depth but the fixed irrigation, the blue dye was at 38 inches and we could not find the, the blue dye anymore. So just imagine if your blue dye here is your nitrogen, your fertilizer. So you are just moving nutrients away from the root zone. You are just leaching your, nu your nutrients. So keep that in mind that you're going to need a proper irrigation management can save with fertilizer. Same thing was done for bell peppers where we did fixed versus control it. We see the same results, fixed irrigation, the yellowish versus the controlled, the darker blue. But one thing interesting is that the controlled irrigation, we had a lower number of fruits, but larger fruits. While fixed irrigation, large number of fruits, but smaller fruits. So proper irrigation event will increase the quality of your fruit. So that's another thing that can increase the profit of a grower because you're going to have a better fruits. And yield for bell pepper was increased in 11%. So those are some of the benefits that a crop irrigation management can do to you for your, for your crop. And if you want to do a proper management, contact us. We can help you. If you don't know how to do that, we can, we can go and do a first year irrigation scheduling with you. And you're going to know how much water you're going to need to apply daily in your crop. More irrigation events, the best. You want to have minimize the number. Uh, we want to maximize the number of irrigation events without affecting your electrical bill, of course. So keep that in mind that the take home message I wanted to pass to you guys here with this talk is that the importance of irrigation strategy. It can reduce your irrigation water. Can 
It can maintain or increase yield of, of vegetables, of your vegetables, and it can reduce the cost with fertilizer. There are tools available for you, weather stations, soil moisture sensors, or even uh, water calculations, uh, water scheduling calculations. One of them are in our um, Farm Basics apps. So you can have access to those tools. Let's use that so you can maximize your production. And uh, basically, that's what I have to talk with you guys today. If you have any question, please. I'm happy to answer.